Who's excited to dive in the Word of God today? I love what God is doing. I love how there's so many people who have chosen to give their life to the Lord, and I just believe, I really fully believe, that God's going to place anointing upon this house to see even more of that as we walk in what we're talking about, authority. But before we dive into the message this morning, let me start off by introducing myself. If you're new here today, if you're new, we're so thrilled that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. My name is Adam. I'm the pastor here. And after service, if you come and just shake my hand, we'd love to get to know you. Uh, but we are in a series right now we're calling Jesus Stories. And what we're doing is we're looking at the different miracles of Jesus. Now, there's 37 different miracles of Jesus that have been penned in the Gospels. And it says this in Mark, that if all the miracles of Jesus were written down in all the books of the world, that they couldn't even contain them. Every single book in the, uh, in the entire world, if all the miracles were written down, that they, they couldn't contain that many miracles. And Jesus did a lot of miracles when he's on this earth. We only have a, a fraction of them, only... Uh, just a small percentage of them that we have seen here that have been penned and written in the Gospels, and I'm thankful for them to see how the Lord operated, how Jesus operated when he walked this earth. Uh, Last week, we talked about when Jesus went into the synagogue and he healed the man of demon oppression, possession, whatever it might be, and uh, he was set free. And they said about Jesus, man, that man, he walks in such authority. He walks in such authority. His actions, he walks in authority. Not only that, but he taught in authority, it said. And I felt like the Lord was just really highlighting this word authority. And so this is part two this morning of a, uh, of a two-message uh, talk about authority. Uh, so if you missed last week, want to challenge you, go back to YouTube and check that message out, a follow-up from that. But we answered two questions last week. Where do we get authority And how do we get authority? And it can really be summed up with just one phrase, and that is obedience to the Father. Obedience to the Father. So where do we get authority? We get it from who? The Father. How do we get it? Through obedience. Now this morning, let me ask you to do me a favor. Because this is going to be a message that many of us are not going to like to hear, I'll be honest with you. But do me a favor this morning. Don't take just one sentence and say, I don't like that. Take the totality of the message. Take all of the message. Don't build up a wall because you didn't like something that I said. Listen to the whole thing. Everybody in agreement with that? Y'all good with that? Because we're going to answer two questions this morning. How do we lose authority? How do we lose our God-given authority? And how do we use our God-given authority. How do we lose authority and how do we use authority? Let's pray right now and just ask the Holy Spirit just to speak to us. Holy Spirit, we just invite you into this room, God. Lord, you are already here, no doubt about it. But Lord, would you open our eyes to really sense what you're speaking to us. Lord, I bind up every attack of the enemy, any confusion that he tries to bring. And Lord, I just pray, God, that only your word would just be released this morning. God, I humbly come and I ask, Lord Jesus, that God, you would just fill my mouth with your words, Jesus. Lord, we all are nothing without you. And Holy Spirit, we have to have you today. We have to have you in every moment of our life, God. But Lord, would you just breathe, God? Would you, would you work, Lord? We just say, God, teach us your ways for we want to know you and we find favor with you, God. So Lord, we humbly come before you underneath the lordship of who you are, God. Lord, you are our Lord, you are our King, and Lord, you are our prize, God, and we fully and completely just submit to you today. We love you so much, and everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Let's dive right in this morning. So question number one, number one this morning, how do we lose 
authority. Let's answer this. How do we lose authority? Matthew chapter 8. It says this. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Notice this. Jesus says, I just want you to get this. I will come and heal him. Notice it wasn't a question. Look at this. Look at verse 6 again. Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented, period. No question. But what does he say next? Jesus just said, I will come and heal him. Now let me ask you this question this morning. Is it God's will to heal everyone? And I'm going to uh, quickly answer that question. Is it God's will to heal everyone? Yes. But let me explain right now all this, okay? Let me explain it. Let's go back to scripture real quick. Look at this. 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 4. Let me explain it this way. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. Say all men. All men to be saved. That Greek word for saved there is this word sozo. And to come into the knowledge of truth. And so, is it God's will for everyone to be saved? Yes. No doubt about it. Right there in Scripture. It is God's will for everyone to be saved. Now, is everyone saved? No. So then we can go back and we can say, okay, is it God's will for everyone to be healed? Yes. Is everyone healed? No. Now, on which side of heaven, you could, you could say, right? One day, everyone will be healed when they get to heaven. But on this side of heaven, not everyone is going to be healed. Now, when you think about that word sozo, though, what does it mean? Look at this. So it's going to be on the screen. It's a full package salvation. Healing, deliverance that Jesus came to give people. The full pack of salvation is healing, deliverance, being saved. And that's what Jesus is giving people. So when you're answering this question, is it God's will for everyone to be saved? Yes. Is it God's will for everyone to be healed? No. Is everyone saved? No. Is everyone healed? No. You might be asking the question, well, why, Adam? If it's God's will for this to happen, why is not everyone saved? Why is not everyone healed? I'm opening the can of worms right now, but it's worth just, just saying real briefly why. Because it, with, it's within this question, whereas we're talking about authority, it's a question that we will battle with. Here's my answer. God never intended us to know good. He never intended us to know evil. When Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was never God's intention for that to happen. And so... We know good now. We also know what? Evil. God's intention was only for us to know him. Never for us to know good, believe it or not, and never for us to know evil. And in the middle of all this, after the fall, and Adam ate of the tree, and he sinned of the knowledge of good and evil, what happens? Sins comes in the world. And we live in this fallen world. Obviously, look around at us right now. The world needs Jesus, doesn't it? And so out of his love, now he gives us this free choice to choose him. Because you can't, what? You you can't love something if you don't have the option. What What is love? Love is a choice. It's a decision we make. Even with your spouse, love is a choice. It's not a feeling. You're making a choice to love your spouse. And so Jesus, out of his love for you, he wants you to choose him. See that? Let's go back. Verse 8 now. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Notice his humility here. But only speak a word and my servant will be healed. This is key right here. This next verse is key. For I also am a man under authority. So as we're reading the rest of this, I just want to ask you the question, and think of this in your mind. Why does he say that? Why does it say also right there? For I also am a man under authority, 
having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Think about that for a moment. How many of you would like that kind of faith? For I haven't found such great faith in all of my years. By this time, Jesus was probably 31, 32 years old, and he had never encountered someone who had that kind of level of faith. Just incredible. Verse 11, and I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. And as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. So why did Jesus marvel? Because the man said, you don't need to come to my house. The centurion says, I understand authority. I also understand I am a man under authority. So why does he use this word also? Because he knew that Christ, Jesus, was underneath the authority of God. And he knew as a man that he was underneath the authority of Christ. And so he's saying, you don't even need to come to my house because I'm a, I'm a man of authority. I recognize your authority. You can do anything you possibly want to do, Jesus. Listen to me. You can't walk in authority unless you're under authority. You can't walk in authority unless you're underneath the authority of Christ. You can't. There's, there's no way. And so every one of us in this room, don't we all want this great faith like this man had? But if we want great faith like this man had, according to this passage, I would say you need to be able to walk underneath the authority of Christ. Walk underneath the authority of God, of how God's intended it to be. So God has designed authority. It's for our good. It's for our protection. And I know that authority, when it comes up, is a very difficult subject because a lot of us have seen authority uh, misused, abused, everything else like that. And we're very hesitant with authority because it's created this wall in between us. And we've seen things. We've encountered things, encountered church hurt, other things like that. And we're like, man, I just can't. But God's intention is for us to be underneath the authority of God. But guess what, I'm about, to, I'm about to go here in a second, but guess what authority should act like? Be servant leaders as Christ was the servant leader. Look at this. It's a pretty controversial scripture, but I just want to, y'all, I just want to preach the Bible. <laughs> you know, I don't want to avoid a topic just because it's hard and difficult. Just because I feel like I'm gonna, I might offend someone or someone might not like it. No, I want to preach the word of God. I want to look at the totality of scripture and preach all of it. Yeah. So I, I don't want to ignore a topic just because it's hard. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 11, 3. But I want you to know that the head of every, say every. So when you go back to the Greek and you work at this word every, what does it mean? It means every. Our problem sometimes is not that we don't understand Greek. Our problem sometimes is that we just don't want to listen to what the Word of God says. And that goes for me too, y'all. I've got growth as well. I don't have this all figured out. I don't walk my life perfectly by no means. I am far from it. I am a sinner. I mess up all the time. And I don't have this thing of authority all figured out either. But what I'm saying though is this, that man, the Bible says this, and sometimes we just have to walk with what the Bible says. So look at this. Let's keep reading. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. So the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is man. The head of Christ is God. So when you look at what head means in a biblical sense, in a biblical sense, what does the head mean? It means leadership. So the leadership 
of every man is Christ, the leadership of every woman is man, and the leadership of Christ is God. But when you go back in a biblical sense and you look at what leadership really is, it's servant leadership first. What did Christ come to do? He came to serve, not be served, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if you have a place of authority, what are you to do? You are to serve. You are to serve first. Just as Christ gave us example of being the true servant leader, because he came to serve, not to be served, to give his life as a ransom for many. So meaning for me as a pastor of this church, I am called first off to be the lead servant. Husbands, what are you called to be in your family? To be the lead servant. Over our families, what are we called to be? To be the lead servant. You see, when we get these things out of order, we're not the servant that God's called us to be. And this whole thing of authority really does become messy. But when the leaders really do submit themselves under God and we become people who are servant leaders first, see what God does? How the order of things should be? We actually, and, and, real quick, servant leadership is not weakness. It's not being a weak leader, a passive leader. What is it? It's strength, it's reliability, it's consistency, and putting the interest of those in which you serve above yourself. That's what servant leadership is. One of our values here at the church, we put it like this. Servant leadership, we believe the greatest leadership is service to others. Every leader is a servant first. From the parking lot to the pulpit, everyone serves. Every role is different, but they are all important. So this is what this passage is simply saying. So the servant leader of every man is Christ. The servant leader of every woman is man. And the servant leader of Christ is God. Listen to me. My job as a husband to my wife is to get behind her and to lift her up, to put, in, put her in a position where she can succeed, to encourage her, to love her, to give her grace, to give her compassion. That is my job as the servant leader of my home. That is every husband's job, to get behind their wives and to encourage and to lift them up, to pull out the best in them, not to put them down, not to be served, but what? To serve as Christ served his church. That is my job. It's every husband's job. And what it seems to me is, man, we have a lot of, lot of, lot of kids in society and culture today who were messed up. We've got a lot of families that are messed up. Because why? Our homes are out of order. Our homes are out of order, church. Look around us in culture today. Our homes are out of order. And so, wives, let me just speak to you just for a moment. And husband's going to get to you in a second. When you pull yourself out from underneath the authority of your husband, you're pulling yourself out from underneath the covering that God has intended to give you. And when that happens and you do that, you have exposed yourself and your kids to the storms of this life. And you wonder why everything is so hard and so difficult. It's because you no longer have the covering that Christ intended you to have. But hear me for a moment. If you are in an abusive relationship, get out. If you are in an abusive relationship, get out and get out now. Do not delay. But if it's simply, I don't love him anymore, I don't respect him anymore, what you need to do as a wife is to pray. Pray, 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 because love is a choice, and you can pray for your family, for God to restore it. You can. Because I believe that God is wanting to put our homes back in order in this place, yeah? But a lot of times the reason why our homes are out of order is not because of the women, the wives, but why? Because the men. Because the men are jerks at home. We're passive. What has culture done to men today? It has taken away their masculinity altogether. It's built men who are weak, 
Built men who are passive, built men who go home and they just sit on their recliner watching football instead of being engaged with their family. And you know what? Sometimes I'm guilty too. I come home at the end of the day and I'm tired. Before I get out of my car, I say, Lord, just give me strength. I know Laura's going to ask me right now, how was my day? And what I want to do is I want to say, hey, it was good. That's all I want to do. That's what I want to do inside. I say, Lord, help me right now to give her more than just I'm good. (laughs) Because she needs that as an emotional relationship. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm there to die to myself and die to my wants and what my needs are and to be the warrior that God has called me to be for my family, for my wife, and for my church. God is calling us men to step up to the plate. He's called you to defend. He's called you to be a warrior for his kingdom. He's called you to rise up, to be the lion that God has called you to be. And so men, stop being passive and stop going after the kingdom of God and lead your home spiritually. And it might be weird for some of you men. It might be really weird to get home and, and, to, and to begin to open up the word of God and to share the word of God. With, it might be a month of just weirdness. And that's okay. Wives, give your, give, your, give your husband grace. He's trying. And you'll get over as a family. Before you know it, after a month or so, after you've opened up the word with your family, with your kids, you begin to share the word of God, you begin to pray together, that weirdness is going to go away. But man, you got to start somewhere. God's called you to start it. Because see, within... Society and culture today, we have, a, we have a way of blaming and saying that's the Jezebel spirit that women are operating in. We heard that within the church today. That's, oh, she has a Jezebel spirit. I want to first off say that men can have the Jezebel spirit too. But maybe the reason why the Jezebel spirit is operations because men have the Ahab spirit today. I think the real issue is the Ahab spirit walking around. Let me tell you a story about Ahab. Ahab was the king of Israel. He conquered more land than any other king other than Solomon. Solomon conquered the most land. Ahab conquered the second most. And then you have David, who we would think conquered the most, but he conquered the third most. Solomon, he conquered land by wisdom. David conquered land by war. And Ahab conquered land by deception. Isn't that what the enemy has done? He's conquered land and he's conquered homes and families because he's deceived us. He's deceived society and culture today. Making men passive. And so because of that, our homes are out of order. And so Ahab, he desired this land that was right next to his castle, was a vineyard. And he went to Naboth and he said, hey, Naboth, I'm going I'm to pay you more than what it's worth and I'll give it to you, and, and, but you give me this vineyard. And Naboth wouldn't do it because it was part of his, his families. And so Naboth, instead of being okay with it as king, what did he do? He went back into his castle in the middle of the day while he should have been working because he couldn't make the business deal Listen to me, there's a lot of men who can go outside the home and make business deals all day long and and crush it, but then when they come home, they're just weak, right? Ahab, he couldn't make this business deal, and so what happened? He went back in the middle of the day when he should have been working, and he began to pout. He began to cry. The Bible says he turned his face toward the wall and began to pout. He went into his bed and laid in bed, and he couldn't eat food because he was um, such a weak wimp. (laughs) There's no other way to say it. And Jezebel came to him and said, oh, king, don't you worry. I'll get that land for you. And so Jezebel plotted, murdered Naboth. And Elijah came and said, Jezebel, because of you doing that, you're going to get eaten by dogs. And Ahab, dogs are going to lick your blood. Didn't happen right away, but 12 years later, Twelve years later, Jezebel was eaten by dogs. I think that today, church, what the Lord is saying to us, what the Lord is saying to us is that he wants to put our homes back in order. He wants to put our homes back in order. The way God intended to be, where the man is the chief servant leader, where he is serving his uh, his spouse, loving his spouse, encouraging them, 
and bring out the best in them. You know, I um, was in uh, marriage counseling with someone on, on Tuesday, and uh, whenever marriage counseling comes up, you always go to Ephesians chapter 5, and everyone remembers this, because um, we kind of joke about it, but some people do, and we'll say, and remind jokingly, wives, submit to husbands. <laughs> you ever heard that? Like, people reminding, but here's the thing about that passage. It says, husbands, die to yourself as Christ has died for the church. Dying to yourself is so much more than just submission. Your husband, you're literally supposed to die to your wants and to your needs. And then, man, it's, it, the home is back in order because then submission naturally happens. Because it's easy, because you're dying to yourself. You're dying to your wants and needs. Look at this passage now. James chapter 4, verse 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Let's go to Romans chapter 13 now. I'm going to come down to that. I missed one part. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So take in Romans 13, James chapter 4. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God, and therefore whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God. Just to lighten things up a little bit, when I was uh, 16 years old, I had a, had a very rebellious spirit about me. And I just kind of want to do anything I want to do. Most 16-year-olds kind of feel that way, you know, I, I say a lot of times. And so if you're in this room and you're a teenager, don't listen to this story. But um, I did something that was rebellious. I, uh, I grew up in a school that was you know, like 4,000 plus, plus kids uh, in the school. So uh, we were just a number. Like, no one really knows your name. Teachers kind of know it, but it's, you're, you're a number. It's really, really big, right? So there was a girl who somewhat I felt like kind of liked me, and so I kind of used the situation a little bit. I had to write a letter saying that I was, the, and I told the teacher this. I told him that I was a trainer for the girls' soccer team when I wasn't at all. And so she wrote a letter saying I was a trainer for the girls' soccer team. And so every single time, and the teacher believed me, this went on for two months. So every time that the bell rang for the girls' soccer team to get up and to leave, I would also, because I was a trainer for the girls' soccer team, I lied about it, would get up and leave. And this happened for two months. It's funny, but how rebellious is that? How prideful is that? I thought that I was different I thought that I could get away with something as a 16-year-old. Come to find out, I couldn't get away with it. I got caught. I had in-school suspension for like two weeks. Should have got probably more than that. All that. But what happened? I had a rebellious spirit about me. And when you walk in this rebellious spirit, and I usurped the authority of my teacher because I thought that I was different and I could, what happens, you're, you're really in line with what Satan really did in the very beginning. Think about it. He was the first one to have pride, the first one to rebel from heaven. And so he rebelled from heaven, and what happens? One-third of the angels fall with him. And just think about that. You have, you have Satan, you have uh, Gabriel, and you have Michael, the three main chief angels. Angels understand authority. I'm just going to kind of submit this. I don't mean that it's actual fact, but what I'm saying, though, is that one-third of the angels fell with Satan, the third of the angels that were underneath him, even in heaven, which is kind of crazy to think about. But when you're in that rebellious spirit, you think you can get away with anything. You can do anything you want to do. You can, you can get away with it. And all that happens is you're going to end your life in destruction. You see, you think that doing what you want to do is power, is being strong, when in actuality it is weakness. Strength is operating underneath God's authority. Strength is operating under God's authority, which is why James says this, which we read earlier, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 
You see, you cannot resist the devil without first, what? Submitting to God. And this is what we're talking about here. Submission to authority. It's a difficult statement. I'm going to make it. When you don't submit to earthly authority, according to Romans 13, which we read earlier, you are not submitting to God. So you can stand, and you can scream, and you can bind the enemy up, but you're not going to walk in that authority and that power if your home is out of order. So we quote that, resist the devil and he'll flee to you. But I'd submit to you, what do we do first? We submit to God. We submit to God. Submit to God, then resist the devil and he will flee to you. Isn't submitting to God saying yes to God first and no to the devil? So we're saying yes to God, no to the devil. But saying no to God, what's it doing? It's saying yes to the devil. I believe the Lord is pulling our homes back in order. So how do we lose authority to answer this question? How do we lose authority? Short answer, by not being submitted to authority. Number two, how do we use authority as servant leaders? As servant leaders, I want to add servant leaders in there. How do we use authority? 2 Corinthians 13.10. Therefore, I write these things, being absent. Lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. So how do we use authority properly? For edification, not for destruction, right? For edification, not for destruction. Edification is one of our values. This is how we put it to church. We see people the way God sees people. We call out destiny in others by speaking life and not death. So we use authority to speak life and not death, but to encourage, to uplift, and to see each other how God sees people. See what a difference that makes? Husbands, what are we to do? We're to call out and edify our spouse. Wives, what are we to do? We're to call out and edify and lift up our spouse. Don't look for the negative, but speak life into them. Speak life into them. Look at verse 10. I should use sharpness according to the authority. The ESV says, so I may not have to be severe. So Paul is saying, be clear with communication. When I use my authority over my kid's life, I try to be very direct. I try to be very clear of what I'm expecting to do, what I want them to do. Very clear with communication. That's part of love, right? I love how Greg Rochelle, this is kind of a leadership lesson. Greg Rochelle puts it this way. He says this, leaders, if you're a leader in this room, Leaders should empower people by communicating with clarity and extending trust. Be clear on what and the where, but trust others with the how. I love that. Leaders should empower people by communicating with clarity and extending trust. Be clear on the what and the where, but trust others with the how. Now, how else can we use sharp communication? We can use it if we're in authority over the enemy for spiritual warfare. What does that look like? As a husband of my home, what am I going to do? I'm going to pray for my spouse. I'm going to pray for my kids. You know, the world will tell us that our kids have to go through a season, a time where they're away from God and they got to experience the things of this world. And I say, no way, Satan. My kids are not going to experience that. I plead the blood of Jesus over them. They're going to know you. They're going to follow you. They're going to know what it's like to be uh, in relationship with you and to follow you every single day of their life. They're not going to know a day outside of your presence. What do we do as a spiritual servant leader? We're going to declare their life that God is going to use them for his glory. Satan is not going to use them for his glory, but only God. They're going to be led by the Holy Spirit every day of their life. They're going to know Jesus, follow Jesus. They're not going to have a half the season of difficulty, a season of going through a time where they're away from the Lord, and they're going to know the Lord. That's how we use clear communication against the enemy. It's through spiritual warfare. As a 
as a pastor of this church and lead servant leader, I'm a servant first, and I, and I humbly recognize that and know that. I, I really do, church. I understand it's a big, huge weight to walk in in that way. And I'm not saying this next statement to, to puff myself up, to make myself look good. I'm not. I just simply want you to know this, like, because it matters. I come in here on Saturday mornings with part of our prayer team at 8 a.m., and I, I anoint every single chair, and I just pray, God, would you, because every chair is representing you in this room. Lord, would you bless their finances? God, would you bless their kids? God, would they experience you, God, in their quiet times? Lord, give them disciplined lives. Lord, I pray, and on Saturday morning, I pray for tomorrow, God, on Sunday, that people would just encounter you and come to the life-changing knowledge of you and who you are, Jesus. And I just say that because you have to know that I recognize, humbly I recognize, as servant leader, I'm here to serve you first above everything else. And part of that is doing spiritual warfare for you and to pray for you and believe that God is gonna ha- has good things for you and call out destiny in you and call out purpose in you. And, and I understand that, man, that God wants to do something incredible in your life. And I need to pray for you. I realize that, I understand it. And so that's why, I just wanna say this, this, that's why it matters where you go to church. That why, that's why it matters that you can trust your pastor. Because you're going from church to church to church to church, you're no longer underneath the covering anymore, you're not. And you need to find a church that you can trust, right? You're trusting your pastor is loving, is, 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 has the best for you, is praying for you and everything else. Because it matters. It matters you're underneath that covering. And it's not anything to, to puff anyone up or to make someone look good. It's just the way God's intended it to be. And so, but the only way that really works is that as leaders, we begin to understand in our culture today that leaders are servant leaders first above everything else. It's not a position, it's not a title. It's servant leadership. Why? Because Christ came to serve and not to be served and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so may God help me and my family and my job to be a servant leader first. May God help you, whatever authority that you walk in or whatever position you are, whatever it might be at church, to serve first. I want to pray for two things today that we would put our families, our homes back in order and that we would become true servant leaders. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes. Let's pray for those two things right now. Lord, we thank you today, Father, that you have good things for your people.